Hey everyone, it's Austin back again with another video for Human Ideals. In this video, I'm going to be talking about a different topic, and that topic is that of urban power. I'm going to be relating this uh, back to the city of Yangon, uh, the city in which I grew up in for most of my middle and high school years back in Myanmar. So uh, my main focus is... Uh, in this topic for today are urban power, migration, and marginality, and how it uh, applies to the influx of rural migrants that uh, Yangon is seeing on a year-to-year -year basis, and uh, how this relates to uh, their pursuit of uh, higher quality services, such as education and affordable housing. I'm also going to be addressing how the government uh, aims to provide these services uh, for them, uh, uh, in terms of factors such as uh, the democratic elections uh, in 2015, um, how this relates to uh, the National League of Democracy, uh, the NLD party led by uh, Do Aung San Suu Kyi. And uh, also I'm going to be countering with these focuses of urban power, migration and marginality, uh, the stereotyping of migrants and uh, how they're how they're often constructed this image of creating their own poverty, being responsible for the degradation of their own communities. And this essay is going to be focusing on how the individual stories of migrants in Yangon, their personal testimonies can be used as uh, agents of change and how the government can create a pu public private partnership to uh, bring about uh, these affordable housing and education services while simultaneously countering these stereotypes. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this essay titled Reforming Yangon, Urban Power, Migration, and Marginality. Yangon, the economic hub of Myanmar, is a city known for its influx of rural migrants. Villagers migrate in the hopes of gaining a stable occupation, receiving better services and housing, obtaining quality higher education, or escaping the decline of their family agriculture business. The city government, however, is often unable to provide for such needs from a lack of funding, caused largely by the sanctions placed on Myanmar after the military regime. This contributes to the elevation of housing prices along with the shortage of low-cost apartments for the rising population. Such provisions were reformed in the country's first democratic election since the regime in 2015, led by quasi-civilian government leader President U Thay Singh. These changes can be analyzed according to three aspects of urban politics, power, migration, and marginality. Urban power can be divided into the ecological approach of Ernest W. Burgess, the elitist approach of Floyd Hunter, and the pluralist approach of Robert A. Dahl. The three lenses coincide with debates on the benefits of urban migration. In Rapid Urbanization, Jennifer Weeks tackles this issue from the capacity to fully utilize government aid, determined largely by migrants' transferable skills and education. Marginality seals this debate by contrasting negative stereotypes with the reality of their so-called self-imposed poverty. The migrants' stories can be used as agents of change, passing reforms by changing private and public actors' approach to power demonstrating contributions brought about by migration, and countering such stereotypes. The following anecdotes highlight variations in the struggles of rural migrants, changing in accordance to their occupational motives. Icho Kai, age 35, is a garment worker who, like many, idealized Yangon as a place of higher learning in her early years. The pursuit of education beyond a 10th grade level is already uncommon for the working class and the desire to learn English represents a connection to the global economy, explaining the high demand for tourism industries in Myanmar. Quote, My dream was to be a tour guide, so I wanted to study English and computers, which is why I moved to Yangon, she said, recalling how in 2000, at the age of 19, she headed for the country's then capital. Since then, however, her hopes have floundered. For the past 16 years, she has toiled in one of the many garment factories in Lanthaya Industrial Zone on Yangon's northwestern outskirts, end quote. The continuation of her struggle to this day suggests an inequity in occupational 
support between locals and rural migrants. This also means that migrants with less high-aiming aspirations like hers can get by on housing developments alone, as seen in the story of Kimia Nosui, age 20. Quote, When she first left Myote, a town in Magui region, Fertline Daya, she ate, slept, and washed in a 10 by 10 foot hostel room with other newly arrived migrants. Her living situation has markedly improved since then. She now lives in accommodation provided by Dong Banla, a not-for-profit organization which focuses on the welfare of women garment workers, end quote. The availability of support may thus be dependent on location within the city rather than the migrant socioeconomic background, illustrating the ecological approach to urban power. Burgess states that the phenomena of succession, whereby particular zones in a city expand and overtake others, dictates the concentration of economic activity. His template of the typical city is divided into five main zones, listed in order of ra radial sequence outwards. They are A, the loop, or the city, city center in which traffic lanes help large corporations converge into a single network, equivalent to downtown Yangon around Sule Pagoda. B, the zone in transition, the region connecting this network with working class populations, composed of small-time shops and manufacturing centers in the Scott market, and in roads such as Bojo, Strand, Thaimpu, and Pabedan. C, the zone of working men's homes, a refuge for migrants having escaped suboptimal declining agribusiness back home, equivalent to the blocks starting from 50th Street onwards. D, the residential zone, or the periphery of upper-class housing complexes, schools, and facilities around Bahan Township, followed lastly by E, the commuter zone, composed of developing suburb suburban areas and satellite towns surrounding the actual city. This last zone is home to garment industries in Lyantara Township, as mentioned in the stories of Ichokai and Kimya Nosui. Their anecdotes show that the city government, headed by the Yangon City Development Committee, or YCDC, can either improve housing conditions or educational mobility for migrants. However, since low-cost apartments are already being developed, the emphasis ought to be placed on the latter. Quote, Yangon region authorities say they are taking measures to provide affordable housing for the poor. In the 2015-16 budget year, authorities commissioned the construction of 10,160 low-cost apartments, but officials acknowledged that with each apartment costing around 9,000 U.S. dollars, they would offer little opportunity to those living in slums. End quote. The template of Burgess suggests that educational support can best be received in the succession of the residential zone by the commuter zone, following the pattern of inward migration. This would provide access to vocational training centers for aspiring students like Icho Kai. Quote, the country has already seen a total of 13 ministries, including the Ministry of Education, conducting TVET, or technical and vocational education and training courses at 247 training schools. The Center for Vocational Training, or CVT, located in Budadang Township in Yangon, and the Singapore Myanmar Vocational Training Institute, or SMVTI, situated in Bahan Township, also in Yangon, are two well-known vocational training providers established by foreign assistants, end quote. Because these centers are funded through foreign aid, the city government should not have to compromise between affordable housing and education. The narrative to be derived from this ecological approach is one where civil society actors foster mobility through these centers, supporting the aspirations of migrants, leaving the city government to focus on affordability and equitable servicing as their prime directives. With that said, compromises may be made in the area of public outreach, whereby the city government has limited proximity to migrants in its subdivisions. As it stands, the national government passes all urban reforms through Developmental Affairs Organizations, or DAOs. The YCDC is an exception as it runs city administration specific to Yangon. In the elitist approach, Hunter frames urban power as an operational effort, quote, moving men to act in relation to themselves or to other organic and inorganic things, end quote. Essential to the harmony of DAOs is the agreement of shared legislative power. Quote, 
Variations in the strength between power units or shift in policy within one of these units affects the whole power structure. End quote. This agreement can be seen in the Yangon New City Project, relaunched in 2017. Serge Pun, CEO of the New Yangon Development Company, or NYDC, promised to refrain from private construction outside of city government projects, establishing a public-private partnership. This is a loss for migrants as private organizations, like those mentioned above, <clears throat> can fund housing and education, educational centers without subsidies allowing the city government to build other infrastructures such as roads, water supply, waste management systems, electrical grids, and so forth. There is a way for the national government to resolve this while maintaining shared power between the DAOs. Each DAO would be unauthorized to reform cities outside their regional jurisdiction, as is already the case. They would, however, be able to pass different policies between cities in their region, and each township would have a separate township Development Affairs Committee, or TDAC. This assignment of different roles can then be reduced to the mobility-affordability dynamic between civil society actors and the city government, applying the ecological narrative to the city itself. This multi-layered hierarchy of shared power at the top and separate roles at the bottom constructs the elitist narrative as follows. The national government looks to gain proximity with migrants by first ensuring the stability of its subdivisions, allowing for more targeted, equitable services on a municipal level. The pluralist approach builds upon this targeted servicing. According to Dahl, politicians are elected into the YCDC or the NLD with the expectation of reciprocity. Reforms are decided according to the voting patterns of migrants and all other constituents making some issues more favorable than others. This is especially relevant given the country's first democratic elections in 2015, marking the victory of Aung San Suu Kyi's National League for Democracy. In following this norm of reciprocity, Dahl exposes the limiting assumptions that politicians mistakenly take. Quote, In allocating rewards to individuals and groups, the existing socioeconomic structure must be taken as a given, except for minor details except for a few men who have dreamed of changing the face of the city. Until recently, the political stratum has assumed that the physical and economic features of the city are determined by forces beyond their control. End quote. Contrary to this assumption, the NLD lists five principles designed to reshape the entire economic system of Myanmar. Such ambitions were present only in the era of Gen General Aung San, the father of Suu Kyi, who led a communist rebellion against the British. These reforms, however, are a departure from the socialist re regime after General Aung San's assassination, moving towards a semi-capitalist economy. Quote, 1. Reduce wasteful spending and privatize appropriate state-owned enterprises in an open and transparent way. 2. Create institutions to support the rule of law, property rights, transparency, and accountability. 3. Overhaul the agricultural sector with a focus on improving rural productivity. 4. Create a financial system that can sustainably provide capital to Myanmar's businesses, farmers, and households. 5. Build critical infrastructure to a level that can support Myanmar's development stage. End quote. All of these principles follow the mobility-affordability dynamic between civil society actors and the city government. The privatization of business gives rise to more vocational training centers, allowing migrants like Icho Kain to pursue their educational goals. Likewise, providing capital to different demographics of voters, each according to their needs, enables more affordable housing for migrants. In essence, the pluralist narrative elevates the effectiveness of ecological and elitist approaches by reforming the country's economic system as a whole. It allows these approaches to be implemented despite the limited assumptions of those elected into the national government, DAOs, or the YCDC. All three approaches are intended to optimize migrants' use of government aid. This leads into the question of whether urban migration itself benefits the city, as this determines the level of funding supplied for their needs. In rapid urbanization, the first concern addressed by Jennifer Weeks is whether migration improves the living conditions of migrants or existing inhabitants of the city. Her arguments suggest that rural migrants in Yangon value the connections of city life above harsh living standards. 
Quote, the social attractions of a city, opportunities to meet more people, escape from isolation, or in some cases, to be anonymous, trump fears about difficult urban conditions. This also implies that most migrants would value educational mobility above affordable housing when forced to select one over the other, given that social connections enable such support. A common source of these connections is from their very friends, associates, or relatives already living in Yangon. Quote, Interviews reveal that after migrants settle down, they themselves may take on facilitating or brokerage functions by assisting relatives or other villagers to migrate and obtain jobs in the city, re resulting in a clustering of migrants from the same or nearby villages in particular factories or destinations. End quote. With that said, having this network allows migrants to seek occupational support only if they possess transferable skills to begin with. This is often not the case since most of them come from an agrarian background, whereas most city jobs require technical or interpersonal skills in the case of Ichokai's tourism industry. Another question Weeks addresses is the extent to which migration should be limited by the city government, and for what reasons. She states that city governments may try to do so by constructing a negative image of the city, or by supporting migrants in services or infrastructure back home. Quote, some countries use household registration policies, while others direct aid and economic development funds to rural areas. Political leaders say limiting migration reduces strains on city systems, slows the growth of slums, and keeps villages from languishing as their most enterprising residents leave. End quote. The first strategy of discouragement by exposing the deterioration of the city unwittingly highlights the negative contributions of migrants. Even if they are successfully discouraged, this strategy may backfire as the city government or political party in question may end up losing the popular vote. A more long-term consequence is that migrants employed in corporations or non-governmental organizations may be unwilling to cooperate in the mobility-affordability dynamic. This will force the government to subsidize both of their needs in educational mobility and affordable housing, leading to compromises in both sectors. The unwarranted generalization of migrants is challenged in the myth of marginality revisited, the case of favelas in Rio de Janeiro by Lisa M. Hanley. In light of such concerns, the Myanmar government continues to support migrants through its rural infrastructure pro projects started in 2013. Quote, the program provided jobs for 264 local experts and 2,050 youths worked on different development projects. The World Bank provided 80 million US dollars to fund the project, which was being managed by the Rural De Development Department. It supported the expansion and building of schools, constructing new roads, constructing and repairing bridges and jetties, as well as the construction of water distribution systems. Weeks highlights an argument against limiting migration, that doing so delays the alleviation of rural poverty. Migrants often send remittances from their city jobs back home and are able to reduce income inequality between households. Quote, in Dhaka, Bangladesh, for example, remittances from city workers provide up to 80% of rural households' budgets, according to the Coalition for the Urban Poor. This is especially important as most migrants move to Yangon from causes including natural disasters, food shortages, or seasonal disruptions in their agribusiness with non-essential causes including occupational and educational mobility. With that said, migrants often find themselves facing more difficult living conditions as a product of their occupation. Quote, Only 60% of migrant workers benefit from some time off per month, and of these, only 35% receive paid time off. 41% of migrant workers are required to work over time. Of these, 40% are not paid extra for their overtime work. Migrant workers also often work in unhealthy and unsafe conditions. End quote. Additionally, the city government may limit migration to maintain a sustainable population size, with the consideration of Yangon's carrying capacity. However, Weeks argues that rural migration is not the only strain on government support. A more significant contributor is the rising population of inhabitants already living in the city, an increase in the number of children born per household. Quote, the proportion of the urban population rises from 29.3% in 2015 to 34.7% in 2050. 
the rural and urban crude birth rates both declined between 2015 and 2050, but the difference between them narrows to almost zero by the end of the period, end quote. If the city government were to reduce crude birth rates, more funding could be allocated towards alleviating rural poverty. Improvements in educational infrastructure can provide transferable skills necessary to improve the Yangon economy. The rise in more educated rural migrants would create a positive feedback loop, whereby the improved economy fosters demand for agricultural products and promotes the infrastructure for transferable skills even further. Quote, Urban growth also helps rural economies by creating larger markets for agricultural products, including high-value products like meat, chicken, and fish that people tend to add to their diets as their incomes rise. End quote. The last concern Weeks addresses is whether migration ensures environmental sustainability for the city. She argues that green policies can alleviate social inequality and improve existing services. Quote, when Enrique Peñalosa was elected mayor of Bogota, Colombia in 1998, the city was overrun with traffic and crime. Under his rule, the city built hundreds of new parks and a rapid transit bus system, limited automobile use, banned sidewalk parking, and constructed a 14-mile-long street for bicyclists and pedestrians that runs through some of the city's poorest neighborhoods, end quote. This narrative illustrates how green initiatives like reducing air pollution or managing waste have the greatest effect on poverty, allowing the city government to alleviate symptoms of this problem such as high crime rates. The reforms of Peñalosa mirror urban densification initiatives by the Yangon government, designed to renovate and clean up slum-concentrated areas. Quote, it is shown that the changes of land use after 1989 by establishing new industrial zones and implementing high-rise apartments in northern, eastern, and western parts of the city change its shape from an elongated shape to a cross shape. This is expected to have better impacts on the city transportation system. End quote. To analyze this from the ecological approach, rural migration led to the construction of affordable housing along the commuter zone, improving transportation networks between the loop, zone in transition, and zone of working men's homes. However, migration does not always lead to environmentally sustainable reforms. Quote, in these development projects, many cultural changes were observed in inhabitants. They lived together with a three-tiered family system in their huts. However, these new apartments had inadequate space to live together, so they destroyed their living environments, disposing garbage, plastic bags, and other solid waste around their buildings, flooding drainages and back lanes with each rainy season. End quote. Even if migrants promote economic growth, these negative externalities of demand must be prevented through extensive land conservation guidelines, maintained through annual environmental and social impact ass assessments by the YCDC. Reciprocity between the city government and migrants' contribution to economic growth inevitably raises concerns over their stereotypes. In the myth of marginality revisited, the case of Avelas in Rio de Janeiro, Hanley deconstructs the myth that migrants, being accustomed to rural living patterns, struggle in adapting to the city and that they alone are responsible in causing degradation to their housing communities. She challenges the social, cultural, and economic propositions fueling the favela's image of criminality. The first social proposition, known as internal disorganization, assumes that, quote, the favela lacks internal social organization or cohesion. Its residents are lonely and isolated. In the case of migrants in Yangon, there seems to be little evidence supporting this notion. As mentioned, the ecological approach states that Migrants perceive the social connection to the city as outweighing any difficulties in their living conditions. The strong support of their friends, associates, and relatives in providing them job opportunities, combined with migrants like Ichokai and Kimianosui living with fellow garment workers, demonstrates their ability to maintain strong, cohesive communities. The second proposition, known as external isolation, assumes that, quote, the favelado is not integrated into the city. He does not make wide use of the urban context, and he never feels fully at home in it. End quote. Here, the use of urban context mirrors the transferable skills of migrants in Yangon, contributing to its economic growth. This assumption is partially true, as migrants like Icho Kain cannot use their skills from home for the tourism industry or any other high-paying field, 
preventing full assimilation into the economy. However, it can be resolved if the, ci- if the city government reduces existing birth rates in Yangon, leaving more revenue to subsidize rural educational infrastructure. Cultural propositions, on the other hand, deal with religious, ethnic, and familial conflicts along with resistance to governmental authority. The first proposition, known as culture of traditionality, assumes that, quote, the favela is an enclave of rural parochialism in the city. This parochialism, the tendency to focus on a limited, incomplete scope of an issue, can be applied to the consequence of shortages in government revenue, namely, the forced eviction of rural migrants. Quote, Despite Yangon authorities' public commitment to developing affordable housing, some activists and politicians question the government's approach, saying its housing policies are ineffective, while slum dwellers usually face evictions rather than support. Wimo, a Yangon region lawmaker from Lantaya representing the NLD, told Myanmar now, using armed force to destroy people's homes simply because they have no legal rights is not a realistic solution to this housing problem. End quote. Resistance to such authoritarianism within the context of a developing city is depicted in the 2018 film Roma by director Alfonso Cuaron. Cleo Gutierrez, the live-in maid of a middle-class family in Mexico City, witnesses a violent student protest against the government, clashing with blockades of riot police in the streets. This is the same government involved in conflicts over land rights in her home village. Although the specific policies were unmentioned, this illustrates why the Yangon government should resolve housing issues without force, be it through public-private partnerships, subsidies, land conservation guidelines, birth control services, or discouraging migration altogether. The second proposition, known as culture of poverty, assumes that, quote, the favelado as a reaction and adaptation to its deprivation develops and perpetuates a culture of poverty, end quote characterized by increased suspicion, criminal activity, and family dysfunction, among other behaviors. A report published by the Danish Institute for International Studies confirms this proposition in Yangon. The fear of eviction was correlated with communal conflict and corruption on a governmental level. Quote, Mistrust between neighbors and criminalization by city authorities are mitigating viable forms of self-organization to substitute for the lack of government services and protection. Simultaneously, the informal settlements are expanding through and somewhat sustained by local big people, including some government officials who benefit from illegal land sales and informal fees for issuing documentation to the informal migrants. End quote. City officials committing such practices only highlights the need for adequate revenue. Of course, this revenue is to be gained through lawful, indirect means, such as raising income mobility for rural migrants allowing for less compromises in affordable housing. The remaining economic propositions restate the need for educational mobility and economic growth, cultivated through migrants' transferable skills. However, there is an added emphasis on personal business opportunities like entrepreneurship while considering the cost of consumption habits. The first proposition, known as economic parasitism, assumes that, quote, favelados are a drain on the urban economy, taking out more than they can give, end quote. Considering crime in townships like Lantaya, this proposition is, for the most part, applicable to rural migrants. This does, not mean that, this does not mean that they are to be fully blamed for such activities. Rather, it is a signal for the city government to shift its spending priorities, reducing the subsidization of crime-ridden housing areas. By strengthening rural educational infrastructure, those very migrants will receive greater income mobility through their jobs, allowing them to afford their rent and not get evicted into crime in the first place. The notion of migrants taking more than they give also relates to their consumption habits. As mentioned, urban migration does not always lead to sustainable reforms, and migrants unjusted to the reduced living space find themselves littering their housing communities. The second proposition, known as economic parochialism, assumes that, quote, both the culture of traditionality and the culture of poverty contribute to an economic parochialism in the favelado. Unlike the first proposition, this solution avoids the extremes of forced evictions and preventing crime through reduced subsidization. 
The argument is that entrepreneurship is a more effective driver of income mobility than the average job in Yangon. For rural migrants, both the average job and a private business will require vocational training, so the city government would still have to find rural educational, fund rural educational infrastructure. However, with entrepreneurship, there is the added cost of migrants taking out loans for their business. This comes with a greater risk of the business failing and loans going unpaid, leading to compromises in affordable housing or other infrastructural projects. Instead, the city government should foster both pathways to income mobility, leaving entrepreneurship for migrants with academic distinctions vetted according to the six distinction testing system in public schools, business connections within the city, or untapped skill sets in the marketplace to minimize this risk as restricting entrepreneurship entirely would stall chances for economic growth. The narrative of rural migration in Yangon is, above all, a reciprocal dynamic between the city government and its migrants. This relationship calls for changes in the way both sides achieve economic success through the strategies and assumptions of urban power, migration, and marginality. Through the concept of succession, Burgess reveals the need for a split role between them, on fostering economic mobility and affordability, fulfilling educational goals through vocational training centers. Hunter expands upon this model by presenting the elitist approach as a hierarchy, designed to ensure stability and equal distribution of power at the top, allowing for maximum effectiveness in the mobility-affordability dynamic on a municipal level. Dahl finalizes the insights in his pluralist model of power, challenging the assumptions of politicians by having this dynamic reform the economic system as a whole. Although migrants, at times, may reinforce stereotypes on criminality or environmental degradation in their housing crises, Jennifer Weeks affirms their contributions in alleviating rural poverty, growing the economy through their transferable skills and entrepreneurism. The city government, in cooperation with its DAOs and the YCDC, only, ne only needs to abstain from coercion on the housing crisis. In doing so, its effectiveness will be elevated through cooperation, public-private partnerships with civil society actors, leaving ample revenue to subsidize Yangon infrastructure. The conflict at the Hangzhou 100 Tax Garment Factory started after a workers' union leader was fired. Fat Pang O oh had just finished negotiating payment of overtime. Hundreds of workers went on strike in protest at his dismissal and occupied the factory for more than a month. Then a riot started. We were very angry at the Chinese manager. He used an electric shock device on one of the female workers. It happened when she was talking about unfair treatment by the management. Most of the workers could not control themselves. Our request to film inside the factory was refused and its owners were unavailable to comment. The factory has been closed for several weeks because of the damage to the production line. The owners have now agreed to rehire the union leader. For the European brand H&M, the violent protest here at the Chinese-owned factory is embarrassing. Staff are still repairing the damage done during the riot last month. Despite improvements in Myanmar's textile industry, labor unions say that still a lot needs to be done to improve labor rights. Since EU sanctions were lifted four years ago, Textiles have become the fourth largest export product from Myanmar. In 2015, the government agreed to a minimum wage of $2.60 per day, the lowest in the region after Bangladesh. This makes it attractive for foreign brands like H&M and Marks and & Spencer. An isolated case doesn't mean that the whole country is going to be like that. I mean, you can look at Bangladesh. Bangladesh went through a period of lots of strikes and things like that, so, you know, one case OK, let's, let's be sensible about it and not panic, huh? This supplier for Marks & Spencer and other European brands organizes regular meetings with the workers to prevent tensions. Despite improving labor laws, issues such as child workers, poor safety measures and unpaid overtime still regularly occur in other factories. Some industry experts say European companies, which have strict policies at home, cannot always control what is going on inside factories abroad. They definitely have a lot of power um, because they have buying power, uh, so they have a lot of pressure they can exert. But they do not own these factories, and in many cases the factories are producing for many brands at one time. H&M says it's deeply concerned by the recent conflict, 
and that as a result the relationship with this factory is on hold. The company also says that it is working with the labor unions to address factory conditions. The Hangzhou 100 Tax Garment Factory is due to reopen on Monday, but it's not clear who it will be supplying to. Stepfasen, Al Jazeera, Yangon, Myanmar. When you're in the West, food is, food is one of the big luxuries that people are willing to splurge out on. But here, especially for Burmese food, it's not always been the case. But now I think people are willing to, definitely willing to spend more on it because they recognize it as slightly more of a luxury as well. Myanmar is one of the world's poorest countries, with a quarter of its people living under the poverty line. But economic reforms since the country's democratic transition have brought in more foreign capital. Yangon, Myanmar's commercial heart, is now bustling with an emerging middle class. That has created opportunities for people like Tet Miat U, a Myanmar-born restaurant owner who grew up in the UK. You know, I grew up wanting to move back, and by the time I'd started university, Bambadori started its sort of slow transition, and you know, there's all these murmurs coming about that there might be political change and this and that. He returned in 2013 and started the Rangoon Tea House, which serves dressed up versions of dishes traditionally found on Yangon streets. When we first opened, I think we got around maybe the first month we had maybe 40% local, 60% foreigners. Um, and in foreigners, you know, that includes expats and tourists. And, and, but now, I think seven months on, we get maybe around 70% of locals. Mohinga is one of its specialities. It's normally sold by street vendors and is considered Myanmar's national dish. The Rangoon Tea House chef uses 14 ingredients to complete the dish, with two varieties of local butterfish. The fish is cooked with bruised lemongrass and added to a broth of chickpeas and gram flour, and cooked with a blend of turmeric, shrimp paste, fish sauce and other additions. Fresh rice noodles finished the dish. On the street, it would cost 500 chet or less than 50 cents. But in Rangoon Tea House, where organic ingredients are used, it costs 4,000 chet, eight times more expensive. We're looking for butterfish. There's two types of local butterfish, and usually we use both when cooking the mohinga. This one is about seven times the price of our other butterfish. Because customers aren't necessarily afraid to pay price for good food, we don't mind going into the market and going straight to the source. And you know, we don't bother spending too much time haggling on the price. I try to be realistic about the future. Obviously, there's going to be ups and downs. What I am optimistic about is that, you know, rather than the bigger picture, on the much smaller picture, all my staff are paid more now than they were six, seven months ago. I can afford to pay them more.